see if I can shot. Shot whenever you're ready. Are you standing for the pledge? Mm -hmm. I can't. All right, if we could all stand, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, welcome, everyone. This is our second Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Uh, to review the 2018-2019 fiscal year general fund budget. The last time we met in this room was Thursday, March 22nd, 2018. Uh, we've had quite a few items occur since then, which we'll be highlighting and reviewing this evening. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, we would like to have Mrs. Crump uh, review some of our staffing projections for next year. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Um, when we're looking at staffing, our goal is to provide quality educational opportunities for all of our students while promoting academic excellence and being physically responsible to all of our communities. In doing that, we have several different factors that we look at. One is enrollment, course offerings, class size, and our resources. So as we progress on, I was gonna say, I don't think I knew this because of this. The first slide we're going to take a look at is our enrollment history since 2010-2011. Over the last eight years, if you'll look at the bottom for each one, we've had about an 18% reduction in students um, from 2010 until the current school year. From last year to this year, we're currently projecting 106. Now that's gonna change with enrollments. We know that, that that's gonna come up some because of kindergarten, but that reflects where we currently are at this moment. George, yes, you have sir. a question? No, I said thanks for the lights. Oh. Them in the lights. Just one area to point out, in 2010, 2011, if you notice, the Gateway High School enrollment was 1419. If you go back two years previous to that, you would see enrollment in the 1600s. What it's would come? not unusual to schools in the area throughout Western Pennsylvania. Enrollment is dropping dramatically. Mm -hmm. And what we're currently projecting for next year for the high school is 1,060. So that is a huge drop in, in enrollment for that. Oops. This is our current projected enrollment for the upcoming year. We've divided it out by grades. For kindergarten, we're ex right now we have currently 143 enrolled. First grade, 231. Second, 215. Third grade, 273. Fourth grade, 236. Fifth grade, 248. Sixth grade, 265. Seventh grade, 240. Eighth grade, 246. 9th, 251, 10th grade, 308, 11th grade, 248, and 12th grade, 253. Can I ask a question while you're doing this? Yes, ma'am. We're looking into projections. Um, I'm looking at UP having so many students. Are we, I don't know what you're planning, but are we keeping all those students there? Are we looking? Is going to be district the way it should be? We're looking at the incoming kindergarten students uh, as far as location. We have an area in Monroeville. I've talked to Bonnie Isha about this on so Strohshine and the extension down past Strohshine. Uh, the apartment buildings and homes located there are currently in the geographical area of University Park. Uh, I've talked to not only Bonnie but uh, Patty Jovanovich with uh, uh, registration. registration. And we are currently looking at those areas and how many students would be impacted by moving them to CSE and or Evergreen. 
those two elementary buildings are closer in proximity than University Park. At the time when the geographical boundaries uh, were reconfigured and, and I was making eye contact with Mr. Elms up there because he was on the board and uh, a former superintendent had uh, redrawn some lines uh, which impacted uh, that area of Strohshine going to University Park, which at that time had the lowest amount of children, but it has exploded at this point. So to answer your question, yes. Okay, that you're just talking kindergarten. I'm looking at the rest of the numbers in that school. Um, they're way over and they'll probably be getting more. Is that up to date? Because I know they had just gotten a couple this week. Is that the current, what they're gonna be considering? That was as of yesterday when we pulled it off. Okay, because I know they got a new one today. Um, that's why I'm just wondering because the numbers are awfully high and they're packed to the mm -hmm. walls right now. So we're going to keep everybody at UP where they're at. We're not going to take. I, I would not recommend disrupting a family or a student that has been in that elementary building for an extended period of time. Okay. But you're thinking like kindergartners in that area. Absolutely, because they would be starting off brand new. Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Why is it so tight in there if enrollment keeps going down? At University Park Elementary? No, they're going up. Yeah. UP is Three going years. up that building. Yeah, but even 10 years ago. We do have a number of uh, special education classrooms, uh, which is mandated by the state, which takes up a lot of rooms that typically would be used for classrooms, say, 15, 20 years ago. Can we move them to other elementaries? I would not recommend that. Can I ask why? Because yeah. they're in the geographical boundaries of the schools. We have a lot that are going to UP, if we're talking special ed, as Scotty brought up, um, that aren't University Park area, that they're bringing over from other schools. Yeah, if there's empty classrooms in other elementaries, why not utilize them? And we would be evening out those buildings by making some geographical changes, especially with the UP area. But the special ed kids come from everywhere to University Park, right? We have actually two uh, buildings that utilize our special education. What's the services other one? Of emotional support, which would be CSE. But you have that, I'm not interrupting, but that's an emotional support learning support classroom. That is correct. It so, would be those students that would correct. be impacted outside of the geographical area of University Park. But UP is the one that has all the emotional support, um, emotional support slash learning support, um, talking to teachers, the emotional support, well, I should say the learning support isn't getting as much instruction with the emotional support in the um, CSE classrooms. So that's why I thought last year that we were looking at individual emotional support classrooms because right now I know the numbers at UP, the emotional support is 15 with a lot still not being identified. And how many more are they going to be bringing into that classroom, you know, with the kids? That's why I think it's overloaded and, you know, moving other kids, if there's other places they can move them. I'm just saying because it just seems that UP is the one that's always getting I don't want to say, well, I should just say the kids that are always put in that class, in that school. If, if we are getting a larger number of Special emotional ed. support kids, do we have room in other schools if we need to create rooms? I would say we have additional classrooms within the elementary buildings at this point, other than University Park and perhaps CSC. If we get more that they are identifying before the end of the school year and new registrations, is it possible that they could look into having another emotional support that if they're not all in one classroom? We can definitely look at that. I have like a backup mm -hmm. plan. We could do that, I'd appreciate it. Hey, Mr. Shaw. I mean, Mrs. Crump, sorry. We're interchangeable sometimes. <laughs> um, when for the last three months we have been working with all of the principals the assistant superintendents we have reviewed schedules we have looked at class sizes um, we have gone through it several different times and feel after reviewing it for the last couple of months we feel that we can make the, the next recommendations 
if I can get the mouse to work. Nope. You just want to go to the next slide? Yes, please. I think it does this for job security. <laughs> he rigged it. Job security. He does. That's all right. He's our Vanna White. Uh, for our professional teaching positions for the district, whenever we're looking at positions, we try to capture through retirement. Um, that is our goal. Whenever there's a retirement or someone leaves the district, those are the positions that we want to try to capture. So this year, we do have an ESL position that will be retiring. We have a school nurse that we feel that with the reduced staff load that we have, or reduced um, school enrollment, and the additional of the two parochial schools being combined into one, that we can reduce our school nurse by 0.5, but then also bringing in an additional 0.5 of staff nurse. This will still give us two and a half full certified school nurses, and each building will also have a designated staff nurse. In our elementary buildings, when we're looking at scheduling, we are gonna have a transfer from second grade to third grade. That's what we refer to as being on the bubble. That class size is just moving along. Um, in reviewing the caseloads, we do feel that we have to add a special education teacher, which will be split between Ramsey and Evergreen. And we are also recommending um, reducing our music teacher by 0.5. Currently, we do have a part-time music teacher. Um, when we review the staffing and look at the schedules, we feel that we can accommodate the lessons um, by juggling some of the schedules. For Mossside Middle School, again, that's a, what we refer to as a bubble class. It will be moving from fifth grade to sixth grade. We do not need a special education teacher there, so we will be recommending that we reduce Mossside by one. However, that person will then be needed at the Gateway Middle School. Where we noticed our biggest area where we could capture positions was in the high school. And so therefore we are recommending the deletion of one English teacher. Currently with this, we do not anticipate a furlough because we have a person who's out on leave for next year. So we're basically going to staff as if that person is not there. For physical education teacher, that is we are gonna capture through retirement. And we are also recommending a reduction in math and science which gives us a total of 4.5 positions that we have can take out of the budget. I was question again. Um, we're deleting special ed, especially I'm seeing at Wasside Middle with the numbers that are coming up from fourth grade from the other classes. Um, we don't need a special education. When I know that um, Ms. Bungard and Mr. Knorr looked at their rosters. They went through everything and felt that they could staff with less, one less than what they have because they do need a Gateway Middle School. So how many special ed will you have at Mossside Middle? Um, off the top of my head, I cannot tell you, but I can get you that information. Okay. Uh, could you also give me the number of students that you have coming from fourth grade into Mossside Middle School? Yes, Any we special can. Ed? Mm -hmm. and how many that we will have at... Gateway Middle to add an additional special ed teacher. Okay, we can get that information mm -hmm. for you. Appreciate it, thank you. The next is for our professional classified positions. Um, we are recommending that we add a systems administrator to our tech department. This is something that we've talked about for the last couple years, however, we have not acted on it. Um, we have looked at several different positions and what their needs are, and because we are adding so many computers and so much of it is systems-based, um, we are recommending that we add a systems administrator. Um, this is someone who would also be able to help out, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, Mr. Smiley with the um, MacBooks, and also to assist with Mr. Brown in all the additional responsibilities that he does. For service personnel, we did have two retirements in our secretarial position. We are recommended that we try to capture a position through there. Currently in supplemental contracts, we have looked at all of them. At this moment, we are not recommending a change. Um, however, depending on the budget, that is open for interpretation. And throughout the last several years, we made um, several cuts. We've made several cuts. With the supplemental contracts. And the last slide will show exactly, as everyone knows, personnel is three-fourths of your budget. 
Um, so it shows the depiction of our current budget for staffing for next year. This does not include cafeteria. Is $31,965,673. That includes the capture of all the positions that we did tonight. If we do not go forward with some of those, that will increase. Each one has its own little pie, which broke out by supplementals, teachers, administrators, the secretarial group, our paraprofessionals um, and staff nurses, maintenance and custodians, and our school police. Go back this. <coughs> question. Question. Could you go back a thing? Um, going to the classified personnel, we're looking at systems administrator. So you're looking to add another tech. Are we looking to just add like another Jesse, Barry, and Sean? I'm just saying because that's who they are. Or are you going to put somebody in as a um, helper to Mico? Or is what are we doing with? our current staff that we have it we feel in in the discussions that we've had that the systems administrator would best help the tech department and myco it would allow it would be kind of like a, a second jesse if we we're using a, that name are we talking a help desk um what we feel is that with our current staff we could provide help desk through that because this person would take a lot of jesse's responsibilities Michael's responsibilities and then we can filter some of that down so we believe with our current personnel that we still would be able to do a help desk um, but it would be more beneficial to the tech department for this position do you have an idea of the cost um typically it'd be about fifty thousand dollars mm -hmm. about eighty thousand yes can you yield back on that piece of pie <laughs> uh, the school place, you show me four hundred ninety thousand dollars. Three hundred. Three hundred. Where, where are we at? Three sixty-two. Supplementals are four hundred. Okay. Uh, what's that all include? That includes staffing for each elementary, all buildings. It includes two two at the Gateway Middle School, one at um, Mossside Middle School, and four total at the high school. That's including with our supervisors. It also does provide some staffing for athletics um, and that type of thing for extra events. That's more their salary is what you're talking. Yes. Okay. How does that compare to their budget from last year? Um, it's not that much over, about $100,000, um, which when we say it's not much, but um, we have doubled what we did. When we, when we started last year at the beginning, we only had planned one or two at the high school um, the elementaries were going to share, and so now with the increase of having one at every building there full time. Full time? Well, I mean, it would be, in essence, two part time people. There would be one school police there for the duration of the day. Full time coverage? Yes, full time coverage. Thank so you. you're flipping two part times at each school? Correct. It will be that, whether we're looking at the scheduling, whether it's half and half, it's probably more going to be like two or three days um, between two different people because that's where we got into a lot of overtime last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about AIDS? Have we looked at AIDS? We have looked at our paraprofessionals. Um, we do feel that that number is high, but until we get all the IEPs in, we cannot, we had to basically estimate what we currently have right now. That is something that they are looking at in the staffing. Um, everyone recognizes that that is an area that we feel that we can reduce the number in. A lot of moving pieces with that. The IEPs dictate a lot of that information. They're currently coming in. Remember, this is just a snapshot in time as of right now. When we move to pass the final budget, Paul, you had mentioned June 27th. You will so, have numbers by then? Absolutely. Board, Paul. Hmm? So this information could and probably will change, but we wanted to give a snapshot of where we're at. Mr. Schott? Yeah, it's uh, Wednesday, uh, June 27th, that was correct. It is. Yep. That concludes my presentation. You. All right, thank you, Mrs. Crum.
<laughs> 50. 50. Well, good news is that we're not going to review I them keep all. Keep mine short so it makes time for him. <laughs> now, again, range of the microphone. Here. Before you start, give me one second. Yeah, sure, no problem. All right, again, this is our second meeting, and as is indicated, it works. The mouse is touchy. Yeah, we better get that new guy quick. <laughs> you better make sure he's certified, that he's able to handle it. We had comments that before the current. Excellent. And um, <clears throat> just one thing I wanted to point out is proposed final. Uh, again, as, as Dr. Short mentioned, this is a, another snapshot in time. Um, as I previously mentioned, we met on March 22nd. That was another snapshot mm -hmm. in time. There's been a lot of movement, increases, decreases. Um, unfortunately, over probably the last three weeks or so, we've had quite a bit of negative movement in the budget, which we'll be taking a look at this evening. <coughs> um, and that's in the area of some increased expenditures and some decreased revenues. Now, in terms of the summary proposed final total revenues, and again, proposed final um, this month, actually on Monday, May 21st, again, you've heard me mention this before in terms of Act 1 and some of the requirements that the district and all school districts have to kind of jump through uh, the Act 1 hoops, so to speak. Um, at that board meeting, the board will be uh, approving its proposed final budget, which is some, one of the requirements the district has to do in terms of putting a budget on display and making some other required notifications with that. But in, again, in terms of proposed final revenue, currently looking at $73,742,000. Now in terms of what we're looking at this evening, and we'll see on, in two more slides, this number doesn't include a real estate tax increase. So decrease in revenues of a little over $2 million or 2.65% compared to the 17-18 year. On the expenditure side, proposed final expenditure currently sits at $75,730,000. Mm -hmm. Decrease of $19,000, um, almost 0% under the current fiscal year 17-18 budget of total expenditures. So taking those two numbers together, decrease in revenues, decrease in expenditures, looking at a shortfall or deficit, $1,988,000. Um, to be balanced through utilization of a tax increase, which would bring $1,230,000 and additional $758,000 in unassigned fund balance. Uh, we'll be breaking these numbers down in some of the further slides and, and some of our updates. And again, I'll skip through some of these slides. This presentation will be posted online for everyone to view. Um, again, I'll highlight any changes on some of the slides as we move forward. Again, in terms of state subsidies, no, no changes. No new information has been released. No significant updates in terms of where the state's at with their budget. So we'll skip through some of these. Paul, if you could just uh, explain how the state uh, throughout the should say all of the states uh, financially does not subsidize public education. Uh, currently, I believe they're 43rd or 44th. I, I, I believe all some the states. Are, yeah, in, in terms of overall, and matter of fact, let me let me put the one slide up again uh, just to show you. The, here we go. This is a perfect slide to talk about that. Just as when you look at the composition of our major revenue streams, local, state, federal. Uh, the state portion, as Dr. Short is referring to, is only 26%. The significant burden, unfortunately, is on the local local taxes for that. Um, Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, is very low in terms of its overall support of public education in the Commonwealth compared to some other states who support uh, public education on a much greater um, percentage compared to what we have here. Um, so again, un unfortunately, when we're looking at our, our revenue streams, um, we don't get a whole lot of support from the state. And the, the federal is even worse 
Uh, we're only looking at 3% of our total revenue budget. And again, that's, that's hardly anything at all uh, when you look at where the overall revenues are. But again, there are significant other states that do support public education greater than the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Hey Paul, what were those about 15 years ago? The state and Fed. It's probably still but pretty same, close. Yeah. If, uh, probably if I went back that far and, and ran some of those numbers, I bet it would still be probably pretty close to that in terms of the composition. Hasn't really changed a whole lot over the years. Probably, I mean, if you look at the, the, the one item that jumps out right off the top of my head is the, the state's portion of their 50% their refund of retirement expenditures. Uh, unfortunately, with that rate escalating as it has over the last eight, eight years or so, you know, a lot of times there would be state budgets come out and they would say, okay, we're giving X number of millions of dollars of public education. Well, a lot of that went into the 50% required reimbursement to PCERS. They didn't have a choice in the matter. They had to increase it to account for some of that. So it, it's kind of deceptive in a way when, when you see and you hear some of the increases the state's bringing to the table for, for us. Um, like the one previous slide, uh, in terms of basic education funding, special education funding, I, I think I recall correctly, it was only, we're looking at $136,000 in new money. I mean, that's, that, that's nothing. That's, that's almost 0%. Again, just another depiction, no changes there. And again, no changes on these next few slides in terms of the major categories, local revenue. Again, just, I'll just highlight current real estate taxes. That's our largest uh, source of uh, support. State subsidies, basic education, again, as I re referenced, retirement, Social Security, we get 50% back. State's required to remit the 50% back to us. That's a required component of their budget. And again, the federal revenue, Title I largest, and uh, the various components there, no changes uh, from last meeting. And again, top 10 revenues. I think those pretty much stayed the same. Might have been one or two slight changes, but overall gives you an idea. And just to, to pick that on the next slide, that's what that looks like. But again, current real estate taxes. 58%. Do we look at to drop more? Do we look for that to drop in the future? It's possible. I'll, I'll show you on, on a slide coming up just where the state of the overall taxable assessed value is. It's definitely not a good situation, let's put it that way. And then also, as we always do, top 10 expenditures, and that's been updated with some of our numbers. And again, just a visual depiction of that as well. And that's what uh, Mrs. Crump had referenced before, about 68% of the total budget between personnel, uh, wages, salaries, and various employee benefits. All right. As I mentioned before, we've had some new significant expenditure increases for 1819. And when I use the term new significant increases. Those are from the snapshot that we did back on March 22nd. Specifically, oops, I don't do that again. Charter and cyber charter school tuition. We had to put an additional $635,000 in for 1819 based on our estimates of the, the major increases we've seen for the current fiscal year, 1718. We had approximately, just to give you an idea, 37 additional students who elected to go to either a brick and mortar charter school or a cyber charter school. Um, in terms of exactly whether those folks moved in and decided to maintain their enrollment in some of those, particularly the cyber charter schools, or potentially whether we've had some folks who decided to leave the district. I mean, that's a possibility as well. But and that's we have analyzed that, and we found that a lot of those students currently are moving into the district and wish to maintain their current status within the cyber or brick and mortar or charter school. Uh, we have talked internally, and we're going to very aggressively try to sway those individuals back or into the Gateway School District over the summer. E either way, though, in terms of 
budgeting purposes, it, it makes it very difficult to budget accurately for that. Again, there was, there was when we were preparing even the current 17-18 budget, there's no, we have no data in terms of knowing any new students coming in to the district that we would have to say bump a number up for. So again, even the, the current fiscal year, um, we, we just, we were, we were way under budget, let's put it that way. Just to give another example for the public and also the board, and I believe I mentioned this to the board, uh, and this is a true actual incident. We had a family that moved in uh, to the district and they were coming from a charter school in Homestead. Uh, even though a charter school was in Pitcairn, closer to them, they still have that right and that option to attend the homestead. They elected to do that based on three, four, five years within that current system. The Gateway School District is responsible, uh, as Ms. Mrs. Isha can testify on this, that we are responsible for transportation from Pitcairn or Monroeville to Homestead and then back. And these situations are truly out of our hands. Yes, within the 10 mile radius. Yeah, 10 How mile much extra that cost us for one child? How much well, extra we day probably have <coughs> a van one at that point. One bus that takes yeah. in one van? Uh, yes, we do have mm -hmm. one vehicle that we try to cluster with a couple of other schools in the area. Um, sometimes it's special ed, sometimes mm -hmm. it's yeah, another regular ed school in the area. Um, we've had kids, I've actually got involved with Woodland Hills for one student. They're, um, we're transporting the child to Turtle Creek gets on the Woodland Hills bus and goes out to a charter school that way just because we didn't have anything there and then we, we meet the bus when they get back in Turtle Creek and pick the child up and take him home so we try, we're trying to be a little bit more creative than we used to because we would have required another vehicle which could add another $55,000 to our transportation budget if we have to add one single vehicle. It's, it's complicated um, and some of the other districts we're trying to do a little bit more of that if we can but it, it's it is complicated. Thank you. Bonnie, and you can also maybe mention how many different schools we transport to. The, and this is staggering if you we're, hear this based on the location of Monroeville. Um, we're, we have 68 schools. And I know a lot of people say um, all the districts around us do the same, but if you just step just to the side of Plum Borough and Franklin Regional and Penn Trafford, they don't have that because of the, our radius. Um, we're close to almost every charter school towards the city, and our boundaries begin at the edge of Monroeville, not where the student lives. Say, example, you're heading towards town. The boundary starts um, as you cross out of Monroeville down by Coles across that bridge. That's where we have to start our calculation of the distance. It doesn't count from the student's house. So that brings us to a lot of places on that side of the, you know, of the, um, on, on that side of the map. If we could just sell maybe a mile or two, we would probably, <laughs> Yeah, and bring it in. We, we, <laughs> are need them all anymore anyway. <laughs> we are challenged routinely for transportation. Uh, Bonnie keeps me abreast of really everything that's happening. Uh, she affirms that it's beyond the boundaries. Uh, we stick to our guns and uh, we, we've saved, saved multiple uh, families, uh, or I should say the district, from uh, paying transportation. Crick. Yeah, Turtle Creek. Creek. It's Turtle Creek. 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 All right. Um, the other, in terms of significant expenditure, from, again from the last meeting, uh, some of the outside placements for special education students. Again, this is an additional required budgetary expenditure increase. We had to put an additional seven hundred forty-eight thousand dollars for the eighteen nineteen fiscal year. Again, another significant area in terms of increase. And this is just a visual depiction. This was updated as well, showing $4,220,000 budgeted total for charter schools. Now, this number does include our own district-run charter school. I wanted to note that. But again, you can actually see... Did. So why is that in there? We're, we're actually paying ourselves for... No, we we actually in terms of our, our charter school we actually have that's called waterfront learning it's through the Allegheny Intermediate yes. Unit so we actually operate our own charter school at significantly less cost so for instance I want to say we're paying an average of maybe about forty five hundred dollars per kid uh, they spend an entire um, school year in our charter school as opposed to fourteen thousand uh, dollars to a brick and mortar or a cyber school for that but as you can see. 
it, we had it kind of fall off and then it's been steadily increasing for that. We found that some students who perhaps wish to attend a PA uh, virtual cyber school, that virtual component we don't offer through our cyber program. And that's enticing to some families who perhaps want to choose that option. All right. Unfortunately, <coughs> we also have a new significant revenue decrease for 1819 and moving forward. Um, in Roval Mall, real estate tax assessment value decrease. Again, we've mentioned this over the last several years. This appeal has been pending. However, it's been impossible to know what the exact result was going to be of that appeal. Was it going to be an increase, decrease, how much? Um, we had no idea. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, this was actually finalized. So essentially, we're looking at refunds to be paid in the current 1718 fiscal year uh, for the previous 2015, 16, 17 tax years, uh, total refunds of a million forty-one thousand dollars. So again, this is calendar years, 15, which would be 15, 16, 16, 16, 17. And uh, 17, uh, you know, oh, sorry, I had to Previous backwards. three years. Yeah, previous yeah. three years. I actually have a slide that we'll take a look at here. I think in the next, it actually might be in the next slide or two slides after that that shows the breakdown for that. One thing I did want to note, there was a, um, a news story, at least one that I saw on television that was incorrect. They were saying that we were going to have to refund 1.5, over $1.5 million dollars. When they were calculating that, they calculated the school district's refund in the same manner they were calculating Allegheny County and the municipality of Monroeville's refund. They were taking the 2018 tax year, and those entities have already billed as of March 1st. The district has not billed for 2018. We bill as of July 1st. So that's, again, that's why you might, if you've heard it, this was a higher number that's incorrect. Unfortunately, though, in terms of loss of revenue for, for all future fiscal years, beginning with the year we're budgeting for currently 1819, over $509,000. So again, when we met here back in March, we were counting on that $509,000 being in our budget. Unfortunately, again, this is loss of revenue moving forward, and we have no idea if there's gonna be additional decreases in value for the mall. As well as a one point, I'm sorry, a 1,041,000 rebate essentially to the, the mall property. Yeah, unfortunately, this is one of those things where this, this is why you have fund balance. Mm -hmm. That's going to that's gonna come out of fund balance ultimately. And in terms of, and again, I have some other slides as well, until we conclude the entire fiscal year with all um, required expenditures and all receipts of revenue, we'll see what the exact net effect is going to be on fund balance. But again, based on the, the calculations that I made, that's, I'm projecting uh, probably in the next just depends on how quick the county sends out two to three, maybe four weeks. We'll get the information from Mr. Fulkerson because it's sent to him and then he forwards it to the district and then we'll process those refunds for them. But again, unfortunately with this one, we have to stay tuned. We don't know exactly when, whether, whether or when we'll see more of these. Let's put it that way. This is the, the, the slide I was referencing before, 15, 16, 16, 17 and then uh, 17, 18. And again, just to get, it just shows the original assessed value of the mall, $105 million. And the new assessed value, as you can see, it was decreased. The difference in the assessed value times our current millage rate and then the, the amounts of the refunds for those uh, tax years. Significant refund and significant decrease. Um, the next couple slides, no, no changes. Again, as stated before, this what we're looking at tonight is a snapshot. We continually monitor revenues and expenditures and try to make any applicable adjustments. And you know, you, you always hope at the end of the day you're able to decrease expenditures and increase revenues. But again, you know, we're monitoring all of those areas as we move forward. I'm going to skip some of these next slides. This is just some basic information on the millage rates and 
some of the, the millage rates in terms of lowest, highest Allegheny County, some of our surrounding districts. Again, no changes on these slides as well. And again, this was just, just to highlight this, no real change on here other than, you know, we've continued to talk about our assessed value issues. And again, constant appeals that are made not only by taxpayers, but the district also makes appeals. We, we take appeals for residential and commercial properties as well. And again, just some historical information for the last several years in terms of where the number started from the last reassessment compared to where it's projected as of April 27th based on the last number I pulled. And I did actually include the decrease in the mall assessed value. That was about $27 million. Now, the, the next slide is uh, visually depicted this, what's on this slide. Again, you have the 2.4. Here's the current number here. And just to draw a line straight across how low that is compared to the last several years. Again, this is in terms of taxable assessed value that includes all taxable properties in Monroeville and Pitcairn. I mean, that's, that's a significant drop in, in taxable assessed value. There's no doubt about it. Oh, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, how often are they allowed to reassess property? Well, that's, that's varied. Um, the last time was through a, um, a lawsuit that was initiated. I mean, honestly, I hope it never happens again. Um, and that, just looking at what it costs the district in terms of fighting the appeals and, and going after the actual values. You know, they, they come in and they, they, as they did the last time, overinflated many of the values. So we had to get back to what the, more the actual values, I'll, I'll use that as, as a terminology for that. Um, the other thing that kind of hurt us last time was that, you know, if they want to do that, which again, I, I don't uh, agree with, if they would have waited even an extra fiscal, an entire calendar year, they w we would have had cleaner numbers to start off with. So that was one of the things we had to do. And let me just go back to the last slide. Since, I, since we didn't have a lot of data from the, the previous reassessment that was done, I think back in 2001, um, it was very difficult to see or, or to be able to look at and determine, well, okay, we know that the assessment started here from the initial numbers provided by the county. Where do we think our final values are going to be? We didn't have that data to look back at. <coughs> so what we were doing at the time when we were building some of these budgets, we were building in some adjustments. Like for instance, back in 13, the first, we actually built in $36 million decrease of assessed value. And that was based on some calculations of properties that were before the board of viewers that potentially could go one way or the other. One of the things that we had to do and be very careful of when we were putting adjustments in as well was that, you know, we were being told and recommended that, you know, whatever adjustments you make, be able to defend it in court. And I was very confident that this number I calculated in terms of that adjustment, I could do that if it was challenged by anyone. Unfortunately, as you can see here, even with that adjustment, it continued to drop. We did some more, another smaller adjustment based on what was in there as well. But again, unfortunately, even with some of the list of properties that are in there before the Board of Viewers, you have no idea how those are gonna turn out. I mean, obviously, the, the, the mall was the largest parcel that was in there, and you know, we, we saw what happened to that one there, unfortunately. Lack of traffic, basically, in the mall. Yes. It sounds um, like they need some good advertising space. And they, what do you think, Dr. Short? Sure. Absolutely. And, and just for everyone's information, in terms of commercial properties, you not, you not only have the land and the building value like you did do with a residential property, you also have the rental income. Uh, that's a very large component of that. And, you know, the, the last time, it, you know, each of us was over at um, Monroeville Mall, they do have a lot of vacant storefront. So again, that factors heavily into the calculation of the assessed value uh, of that entity. So, and again, this, this is not an issue that is solely a Monroeville Mall issue. Westmoreland Mall, every mall in the, in the United States is going through this. Every brick and mortar location is going through this. And you know, they almost need to kind of reinvent themselves and come up with some new hook to get people to come in and shop. 
you know, as opposed to, you know, we hear Amazon and, you know, some of the other online outlets and other options they have that are available now that say weren't available 20 years ago for that. Paul, what was the total amount we used to collect from the mall? Um, let me just go back. <coughs> Off the 105 million, we were getting over $2 million. That was our highest? Y yes, oh, the, at, at that current value. I want to say at one point it was, I believe, at $148 million, but I'm not sure if that might have been a pre assessment, reassessment number possibly on that. So again, I mean, that's, 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 that's significant. And that's just from that one parcel. When I want to say, I have to go and dig through one of my pals, that's pretty close to what one mill was worth for the district. I want to say one mill is about $2.1, $2.2 million. So just from that one parcel alone represents one mill of what we bring in in current year real estate taxes. So a significant parcel, there, there, there's no doubt about it. Who's to say, though, that they will not have their property reassessed again with more storefronts leaving? It's possible, yes. There, there's continued, it's, it's very possible that could happen. Okay. And it, we just don't know how quickly that may happen. And in terms of what that trigger is on their side of things, you know, is it five more open storefronts? Is it ten? You know, we, we just don't know. It, it's hard to say. But... I would say at this point, given what we've seen, we should expect more. But again, we can't quantify that. We don't know the exact timing of that. You know, and as, as, as you see here, depending on when an appeal goes in, I mean, it, it's taken years even for it just to get to this point. So again, we could, again, we could even have multiple years of refunds. I mean, we, just, we just don't know. We just don't know. All right, I'm just going to jump to one of my other new slides here. Again, these are just some of the, the calculations. And you know, just as a reminder, you know, for me, use the term index act one, 2.8%. That's the maximum amount. What does that equate to? 0. 0.5411 mills. That would take the millage rate from 19.3264 to 19.8675. So as the list we've talked about in the past, or 13th lowest, we may move the 15th lowest. We just don't know. It just depends on what the other school districts do. We'll find out probably in July, August, uh, whenever we get the uh, survey information from the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, as that we would always be do. Out of 42 school districts? 42. 42 in Allegheny County? Correct. Uh, again, no changes on any of these slides. And I think the next slide. So again, just to take, just again, just two budget issues with a major financial impact. I mean, I, I picked two, just two of those three. Again, the charter school tuition expenditure increases, 635,000. The loss of Monroeville Mall current year real estate tax revenue for next year, 509,000. Those two amounts combined, 1,144,000. The real estate tax increase of that 0.5411 we just talked about, that would bring in approximately $1,230,000. Just that increase alone would be covering all those with just $86,000 to go towards some of our other increases. <coughs> but again, this, the, these items, particularly this one, you know, there's, there's nothing that can be done about that. Now. And compared to other school districts, charter school expenditures are significantly lower than neighboring school districts. Some of the ones, I want to say at one point in time, I'm not sure if they're still number one. Woodland Hills, I believe at one particular point in time, they were number one. Close I want to, I believe, 17 million per year. Yes, it was, uh, it was the highest, I believe, in the entire state year. for that. I mean, obviously, you know, with our, I mean, we have budgeted $4,220,000. We're nowhere near that. Um, but I remember, just as an example, and just to utilize them, I remember talking with their business manager one year, and I want to say every dollar of state subsidy was withheld from them to pay charter schools every dollar i was shocked when i was told that honestly but again you know significant three significant items that we have very limited to no control over well we 
had some control over charter school tuition. One would argue, I suppose, that there was a reason people started leaving the district to go to charter schools. Correct? I mean, they, most people didn't do this on a whim, right? No, I mean, it's, it's an option. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, and I don't profess to be an, an expert mm -hmm. on, on that. Well, how many All of those of folks have we actually spoken to, the people that left to become charter school We do customers. contact them, and, and if I can explain, it's very few that actually leave our district. It's those individuals who move in who wish to stay within the confines of the brick and mortar and our PA cyber. That's significantly where the issue is. It's not so much leaving our school district. We are head and shoulders above any charter PA brick and mortar school around educationally with test scores, and that approves that. We actually even find that those students who do come to Gateway are significantly behind comparable yes. students in the same grade level. It, it's it's in, it, but inferior. But to answer your question, yes, we do make contact with those individuals. Uh, primarily, and I explained that before, the the PA Cyber School or Charter Connection Cyber School offers more of a virtual online face-to-face. -face. We don't have that opportunity with our cyber program. Um, this summer, we're going to go knocking on the doors again with uh, primarily our home school visitor and cyber school coordinator. Uh, we have brochures that we offer. Uh, if, st if families come in to register and they indicate that you know they're going to be attending a PA Cyber School, we have brochures to try to entice them to stay within our confines. Okay. All right, I uh, haven't had a chance to update the uh, homestead exclusion information. I have not received the gaming number as of yet. I just received from the county, I think it was either this week or I think it might have been Monday, we got the, uh, the CD. So I haven't had the opportunity to go through that. I, I will say, I'm trying to think, I think it's the next slide. I don't think I have the numbers on here, but I believe that the eligible homestead property number did go down from the, the current 17, 18 fiscal year. And that, that's basically a function of a lot of properties that, that transfer ownership. So the new owner has to reapply for the homestead exclusion. Now we are required each year by December 31st to notify those owners. We do a mailing through the Allegheny Intermediate Unit of those properties who have not signed up and make them aware of their of their eligibility. They just have to complete the information, send it to Allegheny County. They verify that they are an eligible homestead and then they include them on the CD that we pro that was provided to the district as of May 1st. Again, we received that CD. Those are the official properties who received the homestead exclusion. If someone misses it by a day, they do not get that exclusion for the upcoming fiscal year. They will be on the next May CD for that. So again, if, if anyone receives one of those notifications that they're eligible, it's very important to complete that as soon as possible and get that to, to Allegheny County for uh, verification of eligibility. But again, we'll have this information updated again once we have the information available. But again, we were just using, even on this slide, even though there wasn't any changes, that was the current 1718 homestead exclusion, $179.15. Now again, th this was updated from the last time, and sometimes I had, had pointed out that had changed prior real estate refunds was one significantly increased you know, due to the million forty one thousand. That also includes some of the other refunds that were on there as well. Um, increase in charter cyber school tuition, uh, that number is on there as well, being up being for there. And again, these are just these are again some of the larger items that we've been able to quantify for that. So just you know, taking these into account, what was either budgeted or what we've identified going through the current fiscal year, looking at a decrease of about $5.8 million that would take to project the fund balance down to $8.7 million. Now again, as you can see, I have the to be determined for both additional expenditures, revenues, and again, until, as I always say, the dust settles on the fiscal year, we'll know the exact impact and exactly where this number is. And uh, we'll know that number realistically probably early September. Um, that's around the time I'm able to, I have all my data in, I have all my reports in, and about the same time that I am able to report that to the board 
and all, as well as have all our financial statements ready for the district's local auditors to come in and audit for that. So again, we'll have to recommended percentage for fund balance. We actually have that right there. Thank you. Total recommended to be between five and 15%. So again, that's just taking this same total number we saw on the previous slide, with the various three components, uh, doing a calculation based on the snapshot of the budget, 11.52% would be where approximately where that would end for 1718. Now likewise taking this a step out, I'm gonna skip these next couple of slides, no, no changes, but again, some, some very good information as well. To jump to taking, again, that same number, <clears throat> again, it's not the exact number. So we have what would be transferred for the capital reserve fund, a million eight one two, and then also a utilization of fund balance to ba balance the budget during 1819 after real estate tax increase, that same number we saw previously, 758,000. So again, projected $6.1 million. But again, th this will change. We just don't know that yet. So again, looking at just taking it with the, the estimated number, that would still be a fund balance of approximately 8%, a little over 8%, which is still right in the middle of the range, 5 to 15%. Still a very, very healthy number. Again, I think a lot of our numbers, a lot of our neighbors, I think if you combined our fund balances, I don't think it would even be $6 million. And that's, that's pretty sad, mm -hmm. but that's the truth. Matter of fact, I can think of one, one school district, I won't mention the name, but if they had to pay out a $1,041,000 in prior year refunds, they couldn't do it. They probably would have to take a loan out to do that. Again, no changes on some of these other slides. Uh, in terms of the, the, the current budget process, as I mentioned previously, uh, the next formal step will occur um, by the board on May 21st at the regular board meeting to adopt a proposed final 2018-2019 general fund budget. Again, it's just a requirement under Act 1 that not only the district, but all the school districts in the Commonwealth must do. And again, we were required to display our, our proposed budget via the required budget form that PDE has out there. Uh, we will compile that. We will post it on the district's website. Also, we will have some additional detailed Excel spreadsheets. Um, so the, the very snapshot that's been depicted in total today, we will have that detail as well, and we will prepare, and I wanna say it'll, it'll be in three parts because it's a very large document in three parts. That will also be displayed at the same time. Um, this document is just a very, very top level summary, but again, um, the public and all of our stakeholders will be able to delve into that and see all the line item detail contained in that budget. Again, that will be happening. And as previously mentioned, uh, the final adoption is scheduled to occur on Wednesday, June 27th. And our final public hearing on the budget is scheduled for Tuesday, June 5th, 2018. Uh, that will also be in the same room at 6 p.m. Anyone have any questions? We'll open it up for questions at this point, Mr. Warren. Uh, question. So we have not finalized negotiations with teachers. Um, Act 93 is coming up. How is this going to impact the budget? Do you have any idea? Well, I, I think some of that it's we don't want to disclose currently. <laughs> well, I'm just saying because Act 93 is up this year that we'll be looking for next year. We're, it is factored in there. We're currently in a meet and discuss process with Act 93. And also with teachers' negotiations? That is correct. All right, I'm going to um, ask for a breakdown demographics of the students that go to UP that should be going to other schools, uh, looking at the difference in the busing. When, when you say other schools, are you primarily looking at that special education question yet? I'm looking at all the students, that if they're not to be going to UP, if they're not living in the UP area, they should be going to Evergreen or whatever. I'm looking at all those students that are being sent to UP. Follow that? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to look. I just want to see the impact that that would have on busing. If any at all. 
Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, losing money off of the Minerva Mall, are we taking any sort of significant or small hit when we're losing uh, the smaller businesses in those plazas, like Lowman's Plaza and the Miracle Mile and with Toys R Us closing? Miracle Mile is actually up. It's up? Yeah. Okay. Miracle Mile is actually thriving. Yeah, Mir Miracle Mile actually just sold this fiscal year, so we actually even yeah. received some deed transfer off of that as well. But I think it's probably at probably its highest value. I, mean, I want to say it's 100% occupancy, I believe, yes. over there as well. It's, it's thriving for that. But, yeah, potentially the, the Toys R Us building, um, that could be something that could be reduced um, depending on how when it's vacated. Um, you know, the owners of that parcel may decide to uh, put in an appeal for that. So, yes, it's very possible. I believe I heard Miracle it. Mile may have sold for $78, $80 Yeah, That sounds about right. right. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a large amount. Yeah. Yeah, I heard the Toys R Us looking to close their doors in June. I, I, is it closed already? Mm -hmm. Oh, Babies, Babies R Us. Okay. Yeah, because Toys R Us is shutting their doors too. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out for those, but yeah, definitely. So you have to see what happens. And keep in mind, we... Hey, Paul, this is John Ritter. Are you able to hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can now. All right, so listen, I just want to give about my two cents here before we close the meeting out. I'd just like to say this, uh, not just for the sake of the board, but for the people at home listening in, it's clear, you know, it's clearly evident that being on a school board and running a school district is not a mechanical process. So we've had a, a great budget finance committee meeting tonight. Paul has laid all the cards on the table as he so expertly does with every one of these meetings. And he's mentioned that uh, there's a transportation, a busing issue, cyber charter school issue, the parochial schools are going through a readjustment right now. The mall reassessment uh, is occurring right now. We're in the midst of thinking about uh, reconfiguring uh, the Gateway Middle School and, and doing something different with, with that property if we can get some money out of it. So the long and short of it is, every school district, school board, has a task in front of them. It's not a mechanical task. We are not driven by numbers. We're driven by the numbers plus. Our own wisdom, patience, tempered analysis. We choose the best path that we can at the time based on the info we have at the time and then as we're seeing right now we very well might need to adjust what we've been doing in order to try to pick a different path and be flexible so that's it seems to me that's where we are right now and this is a very difficult time and so i would ask um, for the folks from the public be, be free with your comments. Give us some direction, some information, some suggestions. The board always looks for that. If you have any ideas, please run them past us. We're, we're quite open to hearing what you have to say. You know, whether for or against, whether we like it or not, we are here to serve you. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, John, before you go, John. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Any uh, the kids last chance? Did anybody qualify? Oh, yeah. Okay, just double checking. I want a full report, all right? I shall do it, Val. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. As I was stating earlier, we do meet uh, probably two or three times a week uh, to discuss budget. It's a moving process, constantly sharpening the pencil and, and doing everything we can do. Uh, programming has not been affected at this point. Course offerings remain the same. Uh, so I did want to make that uh, information available to the public. Any other questions from the board before we check with the public, see if they have any comments, questions? Not? All right. Anyone in the public would like to make any comments, questions? Thanks, Paul and Trish. Uh, very nice job. Just real quick, um, how do you determine uh, or monitor if the school district should reappeal, I mean, with them all. Let's say, you know, you said someone said 10 storefronts empty and it triggers an appeal. How do you determine if it starts to fill up, if that should be a, appealed again? 
Well, I mean, some of that, I mean, if we would see a, a significant increase with that, ty typically most of the things we build are triggered by sales. Um, but normally what happens in, in a situation like that, and usually an owner originated a field, they, they would trigger that for us because they're constantly monitoring that aspect of their, their business. I think what Matt is asking, if we see that the mall has picked up and there's significant, oh, at least, sure. traffic, can we trigger that reappeal? We can trigger to do that. And how, how that would happen is that, it's, let's just say all of a sudden it's, it's 100%. Say, let's say there's no empty storefronts at all. How do, you, do we monitor that? That's, that's my question. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to monitor that. I mean, it, it, you'd almost need someone, it'd be almost a full-time job to monitor all the businesses in the area for that. But if, if you know, just if that would become a 100% a, a, um, full and not vacant for that, then really the next step would be would that we would have an appraisal done on that. Um, yeah, we would have an appraisal done to evaluate and say, well, based and, and, and probably realistically, we would start our own appeal process. Because when you start the appeal process, that's when you, the two sides have the opportunity to do their own appraisals, um, evaluate some income statements to see you know, exactly you know, what's, what's the income looking like for it. Has it been going up for that, which obviously that factors into a lot of that process for it. So, um, but I mean, specifically, I mean, like for instance, I'm not over there to say, okay, we lost one this week or they gained two next month type of thing for that. But if it was so significant that people were acknowledging, wow, you know, the mall looks like it's really picking up type of thing for that, then sure, we would, we would take a look at that. But again, you know, in terms of appeals, there's, there's the owner originated where again, you. you yeah, I, I mean, I, I realize that most of the yeah. time that's if there's some sort of you know, loss. But I mean, my concern was if it starts, things start picking up, is there anything in place so that you know? That, that's my question. No, it doesn't sound like there is. There, there so. isn't. And there's, there's no requirement that's, safe. I mean, say for, for the owners of the CBL to say, okay, Gateway, you know, we've gained X number of dollars in revenue. It would be appropriate to raise our assessed value. I mean, they're, they're, well, they're yeah, they're never, yeah, they're never going to do that. Yeah. <coughs> a question. We do utilize um, Mr. Dice. I want to say. Is Dice's attorney Dice. going to look into that to see if the sales are up or down? Well, as far as like the, the, the sales with the values, yes. Yeah. yeah, they constantly look at that. There's, there's criteria for residential, commercial, in terms of it, but typically when there's a sale value, they'll look at where the sale price is compared to the assessed value. So the spread between those two numbers mm -hmm. would say, okay, does it meet the criteria to take that property for an appeal? Those again, those are district originated appeals for that. So again, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a gentleman in Mr. Dice's office. That's all he does. He's the expert and, and does that. And, and I've said this before. I honestly believe that if we wouldn't have him utilizing and, and helping us with not only defense of the appeals, but also taking appeals, I think our assessed value would be significantly less than it currently is. I, I truly do feel that. Whatever happened that we had uh, talked about the residents that have not paid taxes? They were gonna publish them in the paper and all that to see we could get taxes paid. Has that ever happened? Has, was there any we, we took that as far as posting it on the, the website, the website. Mm -hmm. for that, correct. Yeah. Was there anything that happened from that? Are you aware of? No, I mean, I, I will say, again, in terms of the, the efforts of um, our Weiss's office, um, our, our one person that's our, Ann Wargo, our, our contact under, does an, does an awesome job. Um, matter of fact, I don't want to say there was probably at least three or four properties that she was able to get paid in full. Uh, this current fiscal year. So again, uh, and I think I mentioned this last time, so even when I'm working on in terms of the, the revenue for next year, I need to know, okay, wait a minute, I know there's a couple hundred thousand dollars extra that was collected that we're not realistically going to see on a consistent basis. In, in theory, all of our delinquents, not only delinquent real estate taxes, but all of our other delinquent taxes, we should actually see them going down for that. Um, you know, it, it varies with that as well. I mean, sometimes we've, I've seen so many different things over the years. I've seen sometimes where maybe a business has missed actually paying their taxes even during the penalty phase and even going to delinquent status, which again, there's extra fees on top of that for that. Um, so again, and I wanna say one year we had one property that actually did that, actually went to delinquent then paid it. So it was actually was part of delinquent revenue as opposed to current year revenue. 
Paul Dave has a question. Mr. Weisdorf. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, Dave Weisdorf, uh, Ben Lair. As a uh, John Q. taxpayer. I don't think you need a microphone. Yeah, I don't think I need it either. Uh, as John Q. taxpayer, some of these numbers are alarming. Uh, I wouldn't say bleak, but alarming with the the assessment values going down so far in the last five years. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, completely aware of the numbers. I tried to write it down, I was a little late. Uh, but we know enrollment's down, charter schools are up, and cyber schools are up. Uh, do we have any idea how many kids are homeschooled in Gateway? Uh, we, we do have that number. I it's not in the hundreds, though. No, no, no. Probably no, less no. than 20. Probably. Yeah, but my other, my one suggestion has just popped into my head, seeing as uh, Allegheny Health Network is building a new cancer center. Is there any way to approach UPMC and Allegheny Health Network who pay their CEOs in above $7 million a year to say, hey, look, you know, you're not paying any taxes. Why don't you give us a contribution yearly in our school district and should we approach them and say hey look we're looking for some funds you know we're getting to the point that we're not being balanced and i understand taxes are going to go up everybody understands that but it's you know it's a little bit alarming uh and with the negotiations with the school teachers going on you know it's yeah. I don't know, should I not pay my borough taxes and my school taxes, or not pay my school taxes, or not pay either? You know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy. And as uh, Paul had mentioned earlier, um, e even though what you're seeing today, and especially over the last month, we still believe that we are in far greater Most certainly. shape than districts surrounding us. Well, I know we have a very viable school district, yes. but you know, it's- I, I agree, it's, I agree that- ooh, you know, it's scary to the general public and I'm really surprised that there's, you know, the apathy is still here. Our, our neighbors to the east of Plumborough School District, um, I believe in Dillon, I don't know if you covered Plum, or uh, they, they were furloughing 29 teachers to try to balance the budget. And, and they're one of the school districts that Paul said if they had a refund, one million dollars, I don't uh, believe they, they couldn't do they could it. Do it. I couldn't do it. So they wouldn't have a choice. I do have a question. Um, when we were looking at the numbers from the elementary schools, mm -hmm. University Park <laughs> projected for third grade next year is eighty. Mm -hmm. That according to my calculations, is classrooms of 26, 27, and 27. None of the other grades have near that amount. What are you doing for third grade? We are currently examining uh, the enrollment. Uh, we have not um, decided to allocate another teacher to that grade level. We're gonna see how kindergarten rolls in for this year based on our current staffing projections, which could free up a teacher to make four sections of 20 per section, which is uh, 80 students. We have not committed to that yet because kindergarten will play a factor into that. Okay, but I'm still, I, I don't think you're gonna have 80 kindergartners coming in. No. I mean, but you're, I mean, if you even look at the numbers, fourth grade, you're 20, 20, and 21. Mm -hmm. Second grade, 23 a classroom. First grade, 22, 22, 23. That's a little, I look at it, I have two children going into third grade next year. I know now they're not getting the same amount of education that the third graders, second graders at any other elementary school are in this because there are too many students in those classrooms and it's not fair to them to cheat them of the education because we're not, I mean, this. I think you misunderstood what he said. But if you're, you're still, I, I, I think what, what I'm looking at is there's 80 students right, in this right. class. I mean, yeah. we need if your if your kindergarten right. registration is enough that you're not 
taking a kindergarten teacher away to put somebody in third grade, what are you doing about third grade at that point? Because kindergarten, I know you're still going to get more people to register for because people wait forever. And then you probably get more in third grade. And you're still going to leave third grade at that? I mean, no, no we're, we're not saying that at all. We got, they haven't made that decision yet because they don't have all the factors in place. We're sitting here right now in May. A lot of factors are going to change with enrollment, ins and outs. And we will then come to the board probably in July or August once we have significant numbers for kindergarten to see with our current staff if we had allocated three kindergarten teachers for each building and enrollment comes in significantly less than what we've had this past year or the year before, then we can allocate that additional teacher to offset the University Park numbers. And if, if we don't, then we gotta look into maybe hiring one. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at these numbers because my child sits in a classroom, one of them has 27 students in their classroom now and he's struggling because he can't get the time with the teacher that they need. And this is an, this is an issue and I will not be quiet about it if it's gonna, I mean, it, it's unfair to those students. It is truly unfair to those students and to those taxpayers that are paying for my kid to be in that school that I also look at it, where are you putting another classroom for these students in that building? Because that building is packed. All right, any further questions, comments? Anyone? Nice job, Paul. No, thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, that, that'll conclude our budget and finance committee meeting. I counted thank six you, slides, Paul. <laughs> Not that many. Nice job, Micah. Thanks.